Hi, welcome to today's lecture on J.J. Thompson and the discovery of the electron. As you may recall, Dalton had developed atomic theory and he had said that all matter, all matter was composed of tiny indivisible spheres called atoms. Now, these indivisible spheres were solid, had no parts, but if Dalton's concept was right, how could we explain the experiments that Faraday and Franklin had done that showed us that matter could be made to have positive or negative charge all right, from a neutral beginning? If you can make positive and negative charges, it means that whatever is charged must be part of the atom, that somehow parts are coming off and giving things charge. All right. If this is true, then the atom is no longer indivisible. And so this is what Thomson sets out to try to figure out. He wants to find out more about the electrical nature of matter. How is it that uh, the atom can explain uh, the existence of charges? All right. And so he used a cathode ray tube to do his experiments. We'll talk about what the cathode ray tube is in just a moment. All right? And for his discovery of electrons, he gets the Nobel Prize in 1906. Very brilliant man. Uh, really beautiful experiment, and I hope you're going to enjoy this. All right? So the cathode ray tube is just a long piece of glass tube all right? that is connected to a vacuum pump all right? to remove all the air inside. And it has kind of a protuberance or a bulbous end, kind of like goes wider, all right? So you have space to see what's going to be happening. The second part of it is that it has some electrical plates um, that are vertical and those are called the electrodes. And those are used to produce um, the cathode rays when you connect those to a high, a whole high voltage power source, all right? You have some other electrical plates that are horizontal further down along in the uh, tube and some magnets to try to explore the nature of the rays. And finally, you have the bulbous end painted with a phosphorescent paint. So when it's hit by cathode rays, it glows. And that way, he can find out where the cathode rays are um, present. All right? Now, why is he doing this? Here you have a diagram. You can see it a little bit better. Here we have our vertical electrodes, which are the ones that produce the cathode rays, which is the gray part that you see here. And those cathode rays, if you make a small perforation on one of the electrodes, the one that's called the anode, which is positive in this case, all right, you'll have some of the cathode rays just continue to travel in a straight line and hit the back of the tube, which is painted with a phosphorescent paint. And that's why you see those little flecks there, which tell you that you have a positive, um, a glow or light being produced where the cathode rays are being hit. Now, here's the story. Nobody knew what cathode rays were. They knew that they were produced uh, in a vacuum, that they were traveling from the cathode to the anode. The cathode is negatively charged, the anode is positively charged. But we didn't know if these rays, which were slightly greenish in color, were light or if they were particles. And so that's what Thomson is trying to find out. Thomson decides to put some horizontal electrical plates and connect them to a battery so he can find out if he can alter the path of the, cath uh, of the cathode rays. He similarly does that with the magnets. All right, and we're going to see what he gets from that. Here's actually um, a picture of the actual uh, cathode ray tube that uh, Thomson had used. All right. So when he turns on the electrical field on those horizontal plates, he notices that instead of getting a straight line that you know would give him a point over here where it originally it had been, he notices that the ray deviates. All right. And he gets similar results if he actually just had the magnetic field instead of um, the positive and negatively charged plates there. And so that gives him a little bit of thought. Okay? Here we have 
a picture, it's not a particularly great quality picture, I understand, but a picture of how cathode ray tubes, uh, sorry, cathode rays are bent in the presence of a magnetic field. All right, that's a very large deviation. You can see how the green rays move. All right, so his results, one more time, I'm going to summarize them for you. So the travel rays travel from the cathode to the anode, all right? They travel in a straight line. Um, they are deviated when electric or magnetic fields are activated, all right? And they tend to curve down away from the positive plate and towards, uh, sorry, uh, away from the negative plate and towards the positive plate when you turn on the horizontal uh, electric plates. Finally, the one thing that Thomson did in addition to all of those experiments is that he said, maybe these rays are particular, you know, maybe we behave differently if I make my electrodes uh, from different materials. So he made them out of gold, he made out of silver, iron, he even made them out of graphite. And no matter what he material he made them out of, he got exactly the same results, all right, which are the results that we have above. So, what does it tell us? Or in other words, what did he conclude? And so what I want you to do is, for each one of these points, I want you to write why you think that Thompson got to his conclusion. All right? First conclusion is that cathode rays are not light. Why do you think that he was able to conclude that? All right? So he concluded that cathode rays were in fact particles as opposed to light. So jot down on a uh, piece of paper, on your notebook, uh, why you think that he was not able to, he was able to conclude that they were not light. He also concluded that the particles are negatively charged. Again, I ask you why. Please write your answer. He called the particles, these negatively charged particles, electrons. And so, he wasn't the first person to come up with a name, but that's the name that um, was given to them. And um, he also said that all matter contains electrons. All right? And that these electrons were universal, that had the same properties. All right? And then playing with his electrical and magnetic fields with electric plates and the magnets, he was able to calculate something very important, all right, which is called the charge to mass ratio for the electron. Now, the number that he gets is not important. You do not need to memorize this number. But the fact is that he was able to calculate this and found out that it was always the same number, no matter what. And that was the key to his experiment. All right? This was useful then to another scientist later on uh, to actually find out what the charge and the mass of the electron are. And we'll talk very briefly about that. So from his discovery of the electrons, Thomson is able to create a new atomic model. He, we call it the plum pudding model uh, because it's a British idea. But if he had done it here in America, he probably would call it the blueberry muffin model because he says that the electrons are um, embedded in a positive matrix, kind of like the blueberries being the electrons are in a dough in the muffin or in the case of the plum pudding, the plums in the pudding. All right? Now, I have a small question and I also want you to try to write the answer for that. All right, why does he include a positive charge? Why does he make this matrix, this dough on which the electrons are embedded positive? All right, I want to see your answers next time. And so to conclude, I'm just going to give you a just glimpse onto Millikan's oil droplet experiment. Millikan, we will not study it in excuse me, in the 10th grade. Instead, instead, we'll wait until uh, IB chemistry to learn more about Millikan's droplet experiment. But 
The key is, he did this beautiful experiment in 1909, and through this experiment, he was actually able to find both the charge of the electron and the mass of the electron using the results from Thomson's charge to mass ratio. It's a beautiful experiment. I hope that you're excited and you may decide to look it up yourselves. Um, but with that, we ended up characterizing very thoroughly the electron. We now know that all matter has electrons, that all matter, um, oh sorry, that the, all electrons have the same characteristics, that they have the same amount of charge, that they have the same mass. And that is going to propel us to learn more about the structure of the atom. Next time, we shall see how Rutherford gets to show us more about the atom, in particular about the nucleus. Until next time, bye-bye.